May 2006. Massive explosions rock an American aircraft carrier. The destruction of the USS Oriskany laid to rest an American icon. A ship that played a defining role in US military history for 25 years. The Oriskany was on the front lines of the Korean and Vietnam Wars, engineered for the new age of jet fighters. Her stories span both tragedy and triumph, including a devastating fire and Senator John McCain's capture and five years in hell. Now, an expedition plunges deep into the Gulf of Mexico to explore the Mighty O, one of the great aircraft carriers of the Cold War. For over 200 years, the Gulf of Mexico has been home to hundreds of shipwrecks. Some are cargo ships and oil tankers caught in the path of violent hurricanes. Even a German U-boat sunk during the Second World War lies at the bottom of the Gulf. But 22 miles off the Florida coast, one shipwreck stands out from all the rest. A flagship of the American military the aircraft carrier. The USS Oriskany manned the front lines of America's defense during the 1950s and 1960s. The Mighty O is one of the few intact aircraft carriers in diveable waters, sunk by the Navy in 2006 to attract marine life where there was none before. Now, this massive, nearly 900-foot war machine will be transformed into the ultimate diving challenge. Hey guys, what's the water temperature? Dan Kroll, David Uloa, Becky Kagan, and Roy Connect have come to the Gulf of Mexico to film this legendary cold warrior. The way I look at it, there's three main challenges that we face diving the Riskany. Uh, one is, is the distance offshore that it is. Um, it's over 20 miles out into the Gulf of Mexico. On a good day, hey, everything's great. But we're also diving in an area where weather turns like in moments to uh, where storms brew up. Number two, this thing's huge. This is nearly the size of Titanic. In just a few dives, you can't cover the whole thing. And number three is the depth. Uh, this thing is, it sits in over 200 feet of water, and uh, from top to bottom, it's, it's just massive. Well, headed in, tying into uh, one of the uh, subsea movies down here, so we can get a nice uh, travel system set up for you guys. The team will spend three days exploring the decks of the Mighty O, capturing the images of an aircraft carrier born at a turning point in military technology. USS Oriskany, 27,000 ton Essex class aircraft carrier, awaits launching at the New York Navy Yard. She is the first United States capital ship completed since war's end. September 1950. After five years of construction and delays, the USS Oriskany is finally commissioned. The ship is named for a village in New York that witnessed one of the bloodiest battles in the Revolutionary War. This 30,000-ton aircraft carrier is a bona fide city on the sea. Over 3,500 men work and live on the Oriskany for months at a time. Pilots, deckhands, cooks, and janitors stand by, ready to sail anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. The Oriskany's hull stretches 888 feet long and nearly 150 feet across. Her island stands nearly five stories high and is the operational brain of the aircraft carrier. 
It is in essence an office building where flight operations, navigation, and all command decisions are made. After an hour and a half ride to reach the site, the time comes to suit up and strap on dive gear. Dan, David, Becky, and Roy are all using rebreathers, an innovative technology that recycles a diver's oxygen supply. Rebreathers allow each diver to spend almost two hours underwater, more than four times the limit of conventional open circuit diving. And the dive team will need every second they can get on the giant wreck. It's a difference that recent convert Becky Kagan sees immediately. I had had my training for the rebreather, but I just didn't have enough hours to feel comfortable about shooting video and diving at the same time. But on the Ariskany dives, I had gotten enough hours and it was just an incredibly different experience being able to stay down for 90 or 100 minutes allowing us to see so much more of this wreck. So being able to be on the rebreather uh, was definitely a benefit. The Oriskany sits in depths from 70 to 212 feet. As the divers begin their descent down the anchor line, the enormous size of this aircraft carrier quickly becomes clear. I've been on a lot of other very large wrecks, but those all look like tinker toys compared to this. I'd heard a lot of stories about how big the Oriskany was, but until you're actually on it, you have absolutely no clue how big 900 feet is. Through the misty waters, the island of the Oriskany rises from the depths like a skyscraper. The focal points are three separate bridges used in ship operations. The navigation bridge, the flag bridge, and the primary flight control center. The flag bridge is where the admiral is stationed during battle operations. The navigation bridge is where the captain oversees operations on the ship. And the primary flight control center is the equivalent of a control tower at an airport, often called the pry fly. You can see the way the windows are arranged. Some have windows on the roofs, some have big windows out in front that point down. Others just, you know, just a view of everything. You can see how these bridges would have really been useful. Um, and the, the view from, from the bridge was incredible. I mean, you really could see the entire flight deck uh, operations of the ship. Um, you easily see how it could be handled in that area. A pry flight crew is led by the air boss, who directs takeoffs and landings on the flight deck, as well as controls air traffic around the ship. It is a job that must be executed like a well-choreographed ballet. The Oriskany has been underwater just over a year, making for an awe-inspiring view of the ship's island. Uh, a lot of times when we say we're getting ready to go dive a wreck, you know, I'm used to seeing torn up shards of metal and just debris all over the bottom. And in a lot of cases, some of these wrecks are just mounds of, uh, of fossils or, or artifacts. Um, in this case, she's only been down a year, and uh, there hasn't been a lot of corrosion, erosion, and it really resembles uh, a ship. I mean, it looks like you could just get her back on the surface and, and put her right back into action. That's how clean some of these lines and, uh, are. When I get down there, uh, visibility was really, really good. I see, I see the entire tower, I see, I mean, everything. Uh, the, the, the island is there, I can see from one side to the other of the flight deck. I felt like I could almost see the edge of the ship. Pretty incredible. Uh, but definitely you can tell this is a, a machine of war and its biggest offensive weapon isn't uh, anything that fires from the deck or the tower. It's going to be what takes off from the, from the uh, main deck, which is aircraft. The Oriskany was a ship at the forefront of aircraft carrier design. One link in a chain of military technology that began in the early 20th century. January 18, 1911. Pilot Eugene Ellie lands on a specially built platform aboard the USS Pennsylvania, docked in San Francisco Bay. Less than an hour later, 
he takes off and returns to a nearby airfield. The demonstration may not have been the most spectacular flight in aviation history, but it is the first controlled takeoff and landing from a ship. But this revolutionary concept doesn't take off until World War II, when aircraft carriers propel America to victory over the Japanese. Their ability to deliver strategic, mobile firepower in the days when giant battleships with their massive guns decide the outcome of naval warfare. When building starts on the Oriskany in 1944, the air battles of World War II are reflected in her construction. But by 1945, the prop planes that won those battles are quickly becoming obsolete. Engineers realize they have to go back to the drawing board to prevent the Oriskany from being a useless dinosaur. The wave of the future, jet fighters, are coming off the assembly line. To handle these heavier jet fighters, the flight deck of the Oriskany will have to be massively reinforced. Stronger elevators must be installed. More powerful hydraulic catapults must be built. June 25, 1950. Only five years have passed since the end of World War II, and the Cold War is heating up. Communist North Korean forces have invaded the Democratic South. Korea is a small country, thousands of miles away. But what is happening there is important to every American. President Harry Truman responds and calls for an intervention by a coalition of United Nations forces. In the fall of 1952, the USS Oriskany receives orders, and her fighters begin bombing missions over North Korea. As the team move further down from the island, they draw closer to the flight deck of the USS Oriskany. But navigating an 888-foot-long ship requires more than just strong legs and swimming skills. On the first dive, what we found is that the wreck is really huge and there's a lot of ground to cover. So Becky and David have both brought along a DPV or a diver propulsion vehicle, which we hope will uh, help us cover as much ground as possible. A diver propulsion vehicle is really nothing more than this torpedo-shaped box with a battery in it with a propeller on the other end. With the scooter, we're able to set it to a certain speed, and if we, if we were to get swept off of the wreck in a strong current, uh, it could help us to get back onto it. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Now, some of the downsides, obviously, if the, the battery dies, well, now we've got a 70 to 100 pounds object attached to us that is dead in the water. So there are some disadvantages. Uh, we still have to use our common sense and watch for it, and a lot of times uh, it might add a, 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 a little bit of complacency um, to think, oh, I've got this tool, I can beat out any, any current, and that's not always the case either. The divers take advantage of the scooter so they can fully explore the Oriskany's enormous flight deck, which lies at 137 feet below. The flight deck stretches nearly the length of three football fields. This classic profile is why sailors around the world call aircraft carriers flat tops. As uh, I go down, I kneel down on the bottom, this flight deck is flat. I pan the camera from bow to stern, and all you can see is wreck going off into the gloom. I even shoot over a little bit to, towards the uh, port side, and you still can't even come up with the side of the ship. And the visibility had to have been at least 70 or 80 feet that day. But uh, that just really indicates how, how huge this thing is. A lot of times these aircraft carriers are referred to as cities at sea. And uh, it's, it's easy to see why when you actually stand on the flight deck. The Oriskany is the first aircraft carrier built specifically to manage the Navy's new high-octane thoroughbreds, jet fighters. Starting in November 1952, 
they take part in a six-month campaign to destroy North Korea's transportation infrastructure. One of the jets to take off from the Oriskany is the Grumman F-9F Panther. The Panther is a flying dynamo. Her engines can fire out 6,250 pounds of thrust and propel the plane to speeds of up to 575 miles per hour. Armed with four 20-millimeter guns, Panther jets can also carry two 1,000-pound bombs or six 5-inch rockets. In Korea, Panthers fly over 78,000 combat missions, becoming the first jet to be widely used in air combat and a crucial component to the American effort. By March 1953, the U.S. and her allies have inflicted a devastating assault on North Korean roads, railways, and bridges. Hundreds of enemy positions are either damaged or completely destroyed. I was looking at some pictures of the flight deck before we, we went down on the Oriskany, and you could just see plane after plane lined up on the flight deck. And actually being down there, it really didn't feel much different to me except that we were underwater. You could still see some of the lines for the runway still made out. And I could just picture, you know, the activity that would have been happening there. Flying jet fighters off an aircraft carrier is a complex process and one of the most dangerous assignments in the Navy. A jet fighter needs over 2,000 feet of runway when taking off on land, yet the average runway on an aircraft carrier might be no more than 800 feet. Incredible speed is the key to short distance takeoffs, but powerful engines can't do it alone. On the Oriskany, massive catapults provide crucial momentum. The catapult is a track built into the flight deck with a large piston attached through the track to the nose gear of the aircraft. The system can rocket a 45,000 pound plane from zero to 165 miles per hour in two seconds. The Oriskany's time in Korea is short. She departs in April 1953 after a six month tour of duty. An armistice agreement has been entered into between the United Nations Command and the commanders of the Communist forces in Korea. Three months later, in July, an armistice is signed. But to this day, a formal end to the conflict between North and South Korea has never been declared. Korea was an important Cold War test for the USS Oriskany, but it was only the first. July 2007. I'm looking forward to getting back on the wreck today and um, possibly checking out the bow section. A team of wreck divers are on a mission to explore an 888-foot legend of American naval history. I love the challenge of bringing back, you know, this, these images from underwater. Yeah, that's you know, sharing them with everybody. That's just, you know, just like, this is so neat. It's day two, and Dan Kroll, David Uloa, Becky Kagan, and Roy Connect are heading 22 miles off the Florida coast. Today, they have an ambitious and dangerous agenda, a plan to penetrate the wreck, as well as film the massive bow of the ship. May, 1953. After a successful six-month tour of duty, the USS Oriskany leaves the shores of Korea and returns to the United States. Her crew spends the next two years training pilots, and the carrier is even used in two movie productions about the Korean conflict. But while the Oriskany is in the Hollywood limelight, aircraft carrier technology is rapidly moving forward. In the mid-1950s, an important British innovation called the angled flight deck completely reinvents the way planes take off and land from aircraft carriers. 
An angled flight deck is a separate additional runway constructed literally at an angle to the main flight deck. If a plane has to abort a landing, this runway allows it to get airborne again fast, avoiding a potential collision with other aircraft on the flight deck. In 1957, the Oriskany undergoes a major overhaul to incorporate this second runway. A hurricane bow is also created, enclosing the hangar deck and helping to stabilize the carrier in rough seas. With so much of the Oriskany left to film, the four-person dive team decides to split up and explore the ship. Dan and David take one scooter and head over to get footage of the Oriskany's massive bow. There you go to the bow. Okay. As I get to the bow, I let go of David's scooter and just kind of drift down, right down to the bow of the ship. And, you know, I just felt so minute against the backdrop of this huge icon. And, uh, you know, it was like something out of a sci-fi movie. Now, here I am standing right in front of the bow, like right on the bottom, deepest part. Um, and the last guy to ever see this part was probably the guy who slapped on the last coat of paint. Roy and Becky decide to probe the interior of the ship. This kind of penetration diving is perilous because of the ship's tight quarters. There's additional danger from bulkheads, decks, and ceilings that often block the easiest and safest way out. Only experienced divers should ever enter a wreck. <laughs> Becky and Roy head inside the Oriskany. The doors, hallways, and living quarters remind them of the people who called this aircraft carrier home. It's interesting because the, the ship hasn't been down for very long, so there's not a lot of coral growth on it. So things are still recognizable, like the light switches and like the desks and filing cabinets. It's like swimming through a hallway in your house, and you can see how people were just walking through these hallways and up the stairwells um, into different rooms and offices. Also hiding among the decks of the Mighty O is an escalator, a testament to the extensive size of this city on the sea. On one of the dives, we wanted to see the escalator, and it was obvious when we came to it, and it felt like we were inside of a shopping mall because all of a sudden the floor just dropped down. You could see the escalator go down, and it really felt like you were swimming down an escalator instead of standing on it. And you could see how people would just be going up and down this thing all day long. And it was a very interesting experience. By 1959, the renovated Oriskany is complete. With changes to the flight deck and bow, the Mighty O has been modified to face another decade and another war. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy dispatches a group of 400 soldiers to South Vietnam as military advisors. It is therefore most important. Four years later, 3,500 United States Marines come ashore as the first U.S. combat troops. What started as American military assistance has escalated into all-out war. In May 1965, the USS Oriskany is called to patrol the shores off Vietnam. Almost immediately, these Navy pilots get their first taste of combat, taking part in massive bombing campaigns over North Vietnam. By October 1966, the Oriskany mounts thousands of successful sorties against the enemy. Many of those bombs are dropped by the workhorse of the Navy's attack aircraft, the A-4 Skyhawk. Like the Panther jet in Korea 15 years earlier, the A-4 Skyhawk becomes the go-to plane for the Navy during Vietnam. 
Its compact size makes it the ideal carrier plane, and naval pilots love its strength and agility. The A-4 Skyhawk can reach speeds of 650 miles per hour, has a range of nearly 1,000 miles, and can climb as high as 42,000 feet. Wow. Got to see a lot more that time. Did you guys make it to the stern and no, do a big swim around? We did not make it to the stern, um, but we spent a lot of time in the island yeah. and saw the, the escalator and um, checked out some of the rooms inside of the um, inside of the bridge. Lots of light switches and electrical. After two days of diving, the team still has much of this giant aircraft carrier to explore. Now, in the early morning hours, Dan Kroll and the team are preparing for their final day of dives on this 888-foot-long aircraft carrier. All right, we're on the fast boat today. It's gonna rock. Life on an aircraft carrier is one of the Navy's most dangerous assignments. A fact the crew of the Oriskany found out for themselves when 44 men died in October 1966. As the war in Vietnam escalates, the USS Oriskany takes part in daily combat operations. Attack aircraft take off around the clock bombing North Vietnamese targets in a ferocious air campaign. On the morning of October 26, 1966, a parachute flare suddenly explodes into flames when the ripcord is accidentally pulled out. The lit flare should have been tossed overboard or allowed to burn out. Instead, a panicked crewman throws the flaming tube into a storage locker that contained hundreds of other flares. The action is catastrophic. The single flare's 450 degree Fahrenheit flames quickly ignite the rest. Within seconds, the entire forward section of the ship is engulfed in flames. Yeah, main deck and hangar, hangar deck, so where you entered it. So it's like right in here. That's the down one. Yeah. To the hangar. Shoot it right there. Now, Dan and the team are going to try to find the location of that tragic fire. They consult the carrier's plans. But Dan isn't sure what to expect. The Oriskany has seen many changes over the years. I've been caught in this before where you have a set of deck plans, but when you go down to actually use those deck plans, uh, they're not exactly correct. And uh, what we found on the case, in this case, is uh, little of that was true. But what we're gonna do is, I'm told that uh, somewhere along the quarter deck right here, there's an entrance, and, it, you, and this is all just open. There's a couple of little small doorways right here. Um, and this area right in here is where the flare locker is. So there's a set of stairs right there, so that should be a good indication of uh, where that is. All right, let's see. Here. We're going to go down the elevator shaft? Um, no, we should be able to come right in through the quarter deck. There should be a hole uh, or a doorway okay. right through the uh, quarter deck somewhere. Dan, David, Becky, and Roy make their way into the decks to where the crew of the Oriskany work to contain the flames. Parked mere yards from the raging fire were jet airplanes laden with bombs and fuel that could also ignite and add to the inferno. Men worked feverishly to jettison overboard 500, 1,000, and 2,000 pound bombs. Just one exploding bomb could have set off a devastating chain reaction and destroyed the entire ship. So we head forward through the flight deck. Uh, we pass the machinery, we pass uh, a few other things, but now I see the triple sliding doors. The triple sliding doors just on the other side of that, that's where the fire uh, uh, occurred. That's where the flare locker is. And uh, as we approach there, we go inside uh, one room that's on the plan. But just as Dan feared, the Oriskany plans aren't turning out to be so accurate. 
we go into that area, we go through that door, but when I'm looking for the stairs, I can't find it. Um, so I just had to go with best guess, and um, my best guess was is that this room is where the, uh, the flare locker is. Although the Oriskany is saved from complete destruction, no one on board is safe from the fumes and smoke. The forward compartments near the flames are sleeping quarters for many of the pilots and officers. As the fire rages below, choking clouds of thick black smoke pour through the ship's ventilation system, suffocating men who only hours earlier had survived bombing raids over Vietnam. You know, the area where the flare locker is was in, like on all warships, uh, are tight spaces, They're, the doorways are small, and they're small for a reason, so they can be uh, shut relatively quickly and dogged down so that you don't have any water intrusion if the ship's going down. And, you know, I started thinking about that, and I'm going like, you know, well, why did so many guys die down here? Um, there's just not that many spaces. But the reality is, is that, you know, it's not the steel that burns, it's everything else. And if the paint gets hot enough, it's gonna burn. What else is in there? You know, you've got a, a, a load of ammunition, bombs, fuel, grease, all this stuff, and this stuff burns like hell. And not only burns, but it throws off some nasty fumes. Anytime you pass by a place, whether it be on a shipwreck underwater or uh, a site uh, where terrorists have hit our, our soils, um, there's gonna be a certain feeling uh, of Maybe spirituality, maybe, uh, I don't know what it is. But, uh, but yeah, I'm expecting a, a little bit of a, a heart-wrenching feeling as I enter that area to know that this is where people uh, in the military stood their ground and, uh, and, and fought for their, till their last breath. For three hours, the crew of the Oriskany fight the flames with everything they have. But their heroic efforts can't stop 44 men from losing their lives. It's a devastating moment for the Oriskany. Nine months later, by July 1967, the Oriskany is repaired and quickly returns to Vietnam. But Navy pilots are desperately needed to refill the ranks of the aircraft carrier. 28 of the 44 killed on board had been combat pilots. And now, the aircraft carrier is left with a gaping hole in its fighting force. The commander of the Oriskany requests volunteers from other carriers for combat duty. Many answer the call, including a young John McCain, who would become a veteran combat pilot, a prisoner of war, and finally, a maverick politician. In September 1967, McCain volunteers to serve on board the Mighty O after his carrier, the USS Forrestal, is damaged in another fire. On October 26, 1967, McCain hits the flight deck of the Oriskany and straps into his A-4 Skyhawk. His mission is to bomb Hanoi, targeting its extensive network of surface-to-air missile sites. But McCain is shot down and becomes a POW at the now infamous Hanoi Hilton. A French TV crew interviewed the courageous flyer weeks after his capture. In which unit of the United States forces were you serving? Serving in attack squadron 163 on the USS Oriskany. How long till now? About three weeks before I was shot down. After five years in captivity, John McCain is finally released in 1973, the same year the USS Oriskany completes its last combat cruise, having served 800 days on the front lines of the Vietnam War. By the mid-1970s, the Oriskany and other post-World War II era carriers had been replaced by the next generation of ships. The nuclear-powered Nimitz class had become the new standard. After two wars and thousands of days at sea, time and technology 
finally catch up to the mighty O. On May 15, 1976, the USS Oriskany is decommissioned. The Oriskany spends nearly 30 years on the sidelines, mothballed by the Navy, then prepared to be sold for scrap. But in 1999, a new idea is born. The state of Florida convinces the Navy to sink the Oriskany. As an artificial reef, it could attract marine life, divers, and potentially millions of tourist dollars. After years of debate, it is determined the Oriskany should be sunk near Pensacola, where many of the pilots who manned her airplanes were trained. But first, a complete overhaul of the rusted remains is needed. The 55-year-old ship is full of toxic contaminants, which are finally removed at a cost of $30 million. The day arrives on May 16, 2006. 22 miles off the Florida coast, the sun rises on the USS Oriskany for the last time. After 55 years of sailing the world, the mighty O is being prepared for her final bow. The plan is simple. Four 75,000 pound anchors will hold the Oriskany in place. While 22 charges of C4 explosives are detonated near the seawater valve intakes. The weight of the incoming water will flood the ship, sending her down to the bottom. At 10.25 a.m., a gigantic boom heard miles away rocks the ship. Clouds of orange and gray smoke begin pouring out of the decks of the Oriskany. In just 35 minutes, all 30,000 tons descend 212 feet to the Gulf floor. The USS Oriskany is now the property of the state of Florida. Below the Gulf's waters, the Oriskany is fulfilling its promise of creating an underwater ecosystem, bringing new marine life to a once sandy wasteland. A swim out into the sand 50 feet uh, shows a desolate desert, but once you come back to the uh, to the uh, Oriskany, you can see life just everywhere. And one of the fun things I experienced was playing with the scallops. I mean, these things are just littered across the, the flight deck, and I feel like, like I could just run around and scoop them up, you know, and just like shovel them in a bag. And, and uh, it was just, there was so many of them, you could play with them. It was like poker chips littered all over the flight deck. Since the wreck hasn't been there very long, um, I didn't expect a lot of marine life to be on it or a lot of growth on it, but I was actually surprised that there were so many clusters of sea urchins and that octopus and arrow crabs had already started to inhabit the wreck and make it their home. So I think in a couple years, this wreck is just going to be beautiful and it's going to be covered in marine life and growth. One final task remains. For most divers, exploring a wreck means leaving the site exactly the way it was found. But today, Dan joins dive master Josh Gay in leaving something behind. There is often a powerful bond between a sailor and the ship on which they serve. When the Oriskany was sent to the bottom of the ocean, many of her veterans felt a great loss, as if a part of them went down with the ship. Today, many Oriskany veterans request that their photographs, dog tags, and personal items be taken down to the ship. It's an opportunity for these vets to join the Mighty O on her final mission. To me, it really brings life to the wreck, and it kind of gives some history to it instead of just this hunk of metal down there. And to me, the best thing is actually bringing the vets down themselves because these guys, they were really upset to see their, their wreck go down, their ship go down, and you know they kind of saw it as, as an end of the ship. Well, now that we show them that the wreck is still there, still giving, still serving, that they're really, uh, they're really proud of that. The aircraft carrier that sailed during an age of technological change now brings new life beneath the waves. The mighty O gives back to the sea she once called home. 
a ship that goes down like this, it's, it was placed on the bottom. It's, it's kind of on eternal patrol. It's never, it's never ending, and it, you, you kind of get that feeling when you're swimming alongside her. Uriskany served a very courageous career, and unlike uh, warships of its time, um, it's going to get to live on as an artificial reef.